My name is Judy Fan, and I am an assistant professor of psychology at the University of California, San Diego. My big question is, what do our cognitive technologies reveal about how the mind works? Let me start by telling you about one of my absolute favorite books of all time, Harold and the Purple Crayon. If you're not familiar with it, it was authored by Crockett Johnson and published in 1955. It's a story about the fundamentally creative act of taking what's hidden inside your head, your thoughts, beliefs, and desires, and putting it out into the world. It's a story about using tools to imagine new versions of the world and your place in it. Well, okay, let me be more concrete. But if you don't like spoilers, you'll want to skip ahead. All right, Harold is this kid with a purple crayon who goes out for a walk. And with his crayon, he can draw not just how things look, but real things themselves. He was hoping to walk in the moonlight, but there isn't a moon out, so he draws one. There isn't a path, so again, he draws one for himself so he doesn't get lost. He thought he might have stumbled into where a forest ought to be, so he draws trees there to fill the empty space. And when he gets hungry, he draws some pies. And when he realizes he made too many, he draws some forest creatures to help him finish the rest. You get it. Here's what I love about this story. See, in the purple crayon universe, there's literally no gap between the physical world and Harold's imagination, embodied in the way he uses his crayon. But of course, in our world, that gap is inescapable. There's the tangible world of things and places out there and the intangible world of thoughts and feelings within our minds. And we spend so much of our lives trying to cross this gap. But one way in which we are very much like Harold is that we lean on various technologies to help us. And drawing is one such, what I call a cognitive technology, Basically, a, a technique that humans invented that can enlarge our capacity to think, to communicate, and to imagine. It's also one of the oldest technologies we have. As far as we can tell, it was independently invented both in Europe and in Asia at least 65,000 years ago. So that's roughly 60,000 years before the invention of writing. And what made this technology special is that it allowed people to express their thoughts in a durable format for the first time and thus share their thoughts with others over huge gaps in space and time. And we did. Drawings, diagrams, and other visualizations have long since leapt off of cave walls to play important roles throughout the history of science, from astronomy to biology to modern physics. And a key question I've been fascinated by is, how is it that so many different kinds of pictures, some of which look realistic, like Darwin's finches and Veronica Hall's drawings of neurons, and others which don't, um, like these Feynman diagrams, how do these still look meaningful to us? For much of 2020 and 2021, many of us have been glued to maps visualizing the density of COVID-19 cases around the world. Those maps, a staple of modern epidemiology, trace back to Jon Snow's famous dot map of cholera cases in London, hand-drawn in 1854. By visualizing how cases clustered around the Broad Street pump directly on this map, he went beyond what anyone walking on the street could see to infer that the culprit may be in the water supply. And even far removed from science or medicine, we continually develop new visual tools to see invisible things. There is this famous world history map by Joseph Priestley the horizontal axis represents time, and the vertical axis represents geographical location, which gave 18th century viewers an entirely new way to see the relationship between global powers in space and time. 
All of these examples illustrate that drawing is, at its heart, a way to shuttle ideas and knowledge out of the privacy of our own, of our own minds and into the world as public objects that we can see and touch and modify. A driving question we wrestle with in my lab is how the human mind figured out how to do this in the first place. What must the human mind be like that this technology took off the way it has, becoming the basis for writing, map making, art, mathematics? An idea that we think is really promising is that the ability to create meaningful visualizations arises from the coordination of three core cognitive systems. Visual perception, the set of computations that transform raw sensory inputs into semantically meaningful perceptual experiences. Social reasoning, our robust capacity to think about other people's beliefs, intentions, and knowledge, which together determine action selection the pencil marks, the brush strokes, the lines of code we write, and in what sequence in order to generate the picture we want to make. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we've been exploring this idea over the past few years. We've focused on the case study of pictorial representation in drawings for two reasons. First, because it's one of the most basic and versatile of the techniques we have, and second, because my hunch is that uncovering the mechanisms that explain how drawings convey meaning will extend to more specialized types of visualization. So here's the basic scenario. We have something in the world, say this bird, and a drawing of it. Our question is, what makes perceiving this correspondence so effortless that we're hardly even aware that we're doing so? Now, a very natural intuition to have is that line drawings are basically ways of approximating the edges we perceive in an image of an object. And edges are relatively straightforward to detect in images, so perhaps the brain is also using fairly simple comparisons between drawings and objects in the world to figure out how well they match. Now, the other extreme, the philosopher Nelson Goodman famously argued in his book, Languages of Art, that the ability to perceive drawings as representing objects couldn't possibly depend on resemblance because they simply don't have any features in common. Instead, pictures denote objects as a matter of convention, just the same way that words denote objects. And according to this view, Visual processing alone can't explain why drawings seem to obviously look like real things. This convergence can only be accomplished by some other set of mechanisms in the mind. Now, coming to this question with the benefit of 50 additional years of neuroscience research, our main insight was that this was essentially the same computational problem that the ventral visual stream aims to solve. The ventral stream, being a series of interconnected brain regions that enable us to take the millions of points of light streaming into our eyes and turn them into the experience of recognizing this bird right here. And today, our best computational models of the ventral stream belong to the class of deep convolutional neural networks, some of the most widely used machine learning algorithms today. And we discovered that such networks provide a compelling basis for explaining how and why we perceive drawings as looking like objects. We were far from the only ones to discover this, and there are now easily hundreds of research papers using some kind of ConvNet backbone to encode sketches and natural images for a wide variety of practical applications, such as um, a search engine using sketches to look up related photos. And all of this can be thought of as vindicating a kind of updated resemblance account of how and why we perceive line drawings as looking like objects. But pure vision models fall short of handling cases like informal whiteboard sketches, which of course only make sense if you're aware of the context. So we reframed this question rather than pitting the two accounts against each other resemblance on the one hand versus convention on the other, we instead asked 
if the project of figuring out how pictures convey meaning depends on understanding how visual information and contextual information are combined to determine what is relevant to communicate. And we've made some progress on this front, leveraging what we had already learned about the need for powerful computational models of visual perception with ideas from linguistics and decision theory to build improved computational theories that integrate visual processing and social reasoning to explain how people use pictures to communicate in a greater variety of contexts. And this is an important step because knowing how to combine these two sources of information may be crucial for explaining how modern humans manage to concurrently use such a vast suite of images to convey meaning and why we make line drawings that strongly resemble concrete objects in, in some contexts, but produce written symbols that we need to be taught how to interpret in other contexts. But we're not there yet. And there are still major open questions that would be excellent targets to connect with in the future. For one, when trying to communicate complex ideas, why do we reach for images sometimes, for example, diagrams and graphs, but symbols such as text or algebraic symbols other times? For example, it seems hopeless for IKEA to send purely written instructions to tell us how to assemble their furniture rather than label diagrams. On the other hand, it seems much more natural to make complex logical arguments using language or language-like symbolic expressions. Another question, what additional ingredients are necessary to explain the diversity of graphical representation systems that exist today? For example, some writing systems use an alphabet and others don't. There are lots of different ways to draw a map. What you see on Google Maps is very different from what most subway maps look like. And there's an ever-growing set of emoji to use when communicating online, but what each one means can depend so much on the community you belong to. And the third question, how does the ability to use pictures and symbols to think and communicate develop during childhood and throughout our adult lives? More specifically, how do children's drawings change from mere scribbles to stylish, imaginative scenes? And what kinds of experiences support our ability to gain fluency in new graphical or symbolic systems for communication? So Harold made it look easy, but even without his magical purple crayon, we humans are unique in the sheer range of cognitive technologies we have invented to make the invisible visible. And over the coming years, I'm really eager to see what this diverse intellectual community discovers about how we got here, as well as what new cognitive technologies we have yet to invent. Thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to connecting with many of you during the discussion.